In, uh, on the topic of depression, and it's, like I said, we're going to cover this for a couple of weeks, okay? Um, our last Sunday will be the 13th of June, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but for today, what we're going to do, or how we're going to break this down, is we'll try to give an overview of it, define it, and uh, give a big picture summary of how to battle depression, and then next week, We'll take that battling depression part at the end of the lesson and expand upon it more to get more specific. Um, now, depression is one of those very interesting subjects. I mean, they're all interesting, but where it covers so many things. Uh, almost anything and everything can lead to some form of depression, right? Uh, some form of sadness or melancholy. And of course, there's depression and sadness and melancholy that is sort of, at, at, at the face of it, causeless sort of just happens, sort of there. Uh, and we have seen in our culture a gigantic spike, not just because of the pandemic, but over the past 30 years, a gigantic spike in uh, depression as seen in uh, the rise in uh, prescription medication. Medications prescribed for this very, um, for this very uh, issue. Um, and the interesting thing is, some people have noted that the rise in clinical depression, or the, the um, what do you call it, the diagnosis of clinical depression, has been coupled with the rise in affluence in, in, uh, in American society. So it seems like, well, it seems to be like it might be more than just a, um, or solely a clinical or physiological issue, if you believe that, right? That you have this rise in depression, rise in, um, what do you call it, like just status of living, like people making more money, people well off, everything's going well, but then you have this coupled with a rise in, oh, that's okay. Don't mind me. <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> coupled with a rise in being sad, more or less, okay? So we wanna, it's, it's, it's like right upon us, the topic is right there. And I, I bet you, you know somebody who has struggled with this. You might be somebody who has struggled with this, do struggle with this. You might be someone who has been or is on medication. You might know someone, I bet you, that know uh, that, that is on a prescription medication for depression. It is the most commonly prescribed drug out there. Um, and so there's just no way around it. It's all around us. Um, and how do we deal with it? How do we think about it, and how do we do so without just kind of slamming the other side, if you will, and thinking that we're right about everything. So it just becomes a very tricky subject to have to deal, uh, to deal with, but the Bible says a lot about it, all right? So let's tackle this by definition, number one. So we talk about depression. We're not just talking about being sad because everybody goes through that, but by definition, depression would be a deep and abiding sense of hopelessness and despair with associated feelings and thoughts of purposelessness, uselessness, and an unwillingness and or inability to function as one normally would. So it has to be something more than just your typical, and I'll say that in letter B down below, all right? Uh, so letter A, for example, it's not just a bereavement as in natural grief over the loss of a loved one, or if you lose your job, or some kind of a real loss in life. That's understandable. We can grieve, Paul says, but don't grieve as one without hope. So he understands that. He himself was sorrowful, yet always, rejoice, always rejoicing, right? Um, letter B, it's not just a typical level of sadness that one has for a moderate length of time. I guess even that could be considered depression. I'm not talking about medical diagnosis, okay, here? Because I'm not a doctor, and so, and that's not what we're talking about. That, so it's not just a typical level of sadness that one has for a moderate or short length of time, um, which can happen for all sorts of reasons, but something deeper, something more abiding, something that's clinging on to you, so let her see. It's a profound, all-encompassing type of sadness. It's like a shroud that envelops you, that often seems, often seems out of the blue, and not necessarily has an immediately perceived cause. That 
you know, that the person got into an accident and therefore, da, da, da. or that person lost this thing in their life and now they're, they're going through marital struggles or their child has gone wayward, therefore. So those things are like more understandable, right? It could still lead to depression, but typically what we're talking about here is something that seems at the face of it causeless and something that's lasting and all encompassing and just is sinking you, okay? Letter D. However, we must say this, feeling sad, even profoundly sad, <clears throat> does not automatically qualify as sin, but it can very easily and very quickly, and where that line is is hard to say. There's no line with lots of these things, right? You just know it when you're in it, and if you're dealing with a friend or a loved one who's going through it, you know it when you're around them, that it can become sinful if left unchecked, if left spiritually untreated. For example, if you just wallow in it, as with any other negative emotion, it's sinful, right? If you just wallow in it, it becomes a form of pride, it's self-pity. If you're drawing attention to yourself, even though you wanna, usually when depression, you wanna retract from everybody, but it's a weird, bizarre form of pride there. That can happen. Or if you use your depression to not do something you should do or do something that you shouldn't do. The you shouldn't do often happens because you're trying to get out of it, so you rely on substances or sinful activities or activities that become idolatrous to an idolatrous level, uh, like overeating, for example. Some people do that when they are stressed or depressed, they overeat, right? Or they exercise till that their whole life is dominated by health or something like that. Uh, and that's, that, that's idolatry, that's false worship. Or if it becomes an occasion where you are just entrenched in doubt and disbelief of God and his promises to you, so a couple of clear examples of this would be, let's say, <clears throat> lingering guilt. We talked about this the last few weeks, right? Lingering guilt after repentance. So you've repented of your sin, you receive Christ's forgiveness, so far as it seems, but then you're just haunted by the guilt of that sin, or uh, there's like the haunting and the regrets about your pre-conversion life. Like, and Z. Martin Lloyd-Jones, by the way, super helpful on this whole topic in his book, oddly enough, Spiritual Depression. But he um, talks about how people have vain regrets about their past. They say, why didn't I get saved earlier? I got saved too late in life. And look at all the, you know, look, look at all the, um, the evil that I did pre-conversion. And I was such a mess. And now that I'm older, but I got saved when I was older. And that's why my marriage is like this. And that's why my children are like this. And that's why I'm like this. And you just get depressed because of that. Or let's say like hopelessness, utter hopelessness, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 in the face of some trial, like the loss of a loved one there in 1st S4. They got taught some bad theology, uh, and so they were grieving, but without hope. And he had to correct them and check them on that, okay? So these are some ways that if left unchecked, it could turn very bad, very sinful, very deep and dark, and can twist and corrupt everything in your mind, in your emotions, and really just sap you of every will to move on. And some of us have been there. It's a very serious thing. And it's very hard. And if you've ever talked to someone trying to pull them out of that downward spiral, you can feel like you're just trying to, I don't know what the best, you know, you're, you're like in quicksand with them, trying to get the quicksand out. And you feel like the more you're doing this, the more you're having, the more that that person is sinking, and you feel like you're sinking along with them. And so... Here's the thing, there's no miracle cure. You notice with a lot of these spiritual problems, there's no miracle cure that just takes everything away and immediately everyone is perfectly fine. It's just the human heart doesn't work that way and God did not intend things to work that way. Now, could it happen that it works that way? And that's like saying, sure, God can do anything. I mean, of course, anything can work out according to God's will, that's his will, but by and large, it doesn't work that way. No magic bullet, it takes time. And I think one of the, I think probably the main reason why something like this takes time is because if things like this just immediately went away with one thing that you did, one good quiet time, and it's all gone, would be we would never rely on him after that. We would never have a sense of need for him. We would just say, oh, all I had to do was open my Bible and read it and everything would just be rosy. You know, you know how, how we are our, in our natural, our, our flesh, we... We are self-reliant and independent, and we don't want to trust in God. We'd rather trust in ourselves. It's easier that way. We don't want to yield control to him deep down inside. We struggle with that. That's the battle of faith. 
And so I think God does it so that, look, sometimes he keeps us under certain things, not to, not to be cruel, not to, you know, break us in some harmful way, but to break our pride and to develop in us a greater hunger and thirst for righteousness and for Christ and for, uh, for fellowship with him, okay? Charles Spurgeon. I don't know if you've read his biography or read much about him. I think most of us here know who he is, but for most of his adult life, he battled with often severe depression. Um, a lot of it, they say, was kicked off when um, he was preaching and uh, long story short, there was a, you know, a fire was yelled out in, um, I forgot what the building was, Surrey Hall, I think Surrey Gardens. And there were thousands of people in the audience and, and a stampede basically happened and people, people died, right? Isn't that the story? Yeah. yeah, people died. And after that happened, he was crushed. He was, of course, can you imagine? He's like, I, I was responsible for this. Although he wasn't, but uh, from that moment on, it seemed like, and there were lots of other things in his life, by the way. And in some ways, you're like, I can understand. <laughs> he was demonized by the other side, relentlessly picked apart and criticized in public. You know, he was a famous public figure at a certain point in his life. His wife became an invalid for the last oh, 30 years of their, of their married life together. He had all sorts of troubles all around him. So some of that you understand. But he would talk often about a causeless depression that would hit him. And he would say, it's just like, it's, he, see, he would say, that causeless despondency is my worst vice. And he would loathe himself for it. But he would also say that the only way out was a renewed faith in God. So... There you go. That's the, 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 the answer right there. But we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit more. He talked about how he would weep by the hour like a child. He would just find himself uncontrollably sobbing because he said, yet not know why he wept. Because it wasn't like, oh, they're criticizing me in public and tearing me apart and trying to like malign my name. Therefore, I'm crying. It wasn't like that. And so he would call it this malig his malignant sadness. Um, and you, when you read a lot of different, you know, it, this is not a new problem. You read like old uh, Puritan writings, um, there it's all, all over the place there as well, okay? So just to know that even for the best of them, it can strike, all right? It, it can be there and it's something that you, you know, by God's grace, he gives and he allows and you have to deal with it. Now, how do we deal with it? But before we get there, possible causes and factors. Letter A, just like with Spurgeon, for example, sure, external trials and hardships. That's the most obvious cause or factor of depression. You have terrible trials or challenges in your life. They will depress you. They will, okay? Um, but here's an interesting thought. Depression in this case, external trial, some kind of um, challenge, is, aggrava is aggravated if you think that Christianity means a carefree life. So if you think Christianity is a ticket out of pain, bad things happen, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be more depressed, more sad. Or if that person thinks that by being good, by being more righteous, it exempts me from pain. I don't know if you've ever thought that. I think we all have, it's sort of like you're bartering with God. If I'm better, then God will give me an easier life. But then if tough things happen, what happens? You're just like, wait a minute, God, I was morally upright. I was righteous. How could you then pay me back with, with this challenge, with this trial? So you're seeing your relationship with God as a transactional one. And that'll certainly depress you because, <laughs> because life is hard and sad and cruel and miserable. Sorry, but it's true. It's short and brutish and awful. It's terrible. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but it is. Should we pose? <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, but honestly, the Bible tells us that. It says all creation is groaning and you're groaning. So usually when it says something like all creation is groaning, it's subjected to futility. By the way, you're futile, you're groaning. I don't know what, what other way to say it, but life, like Ecclesiastes, right? It's all vanity. In one sense, in one sense, it is all vanity. You work hard, you make a good living for yourself, you leave something behind, and then you die. It's all vanity. What did I do all that for? Why did I get that degree? Why did I get that job? Why did I do this? Why did I do that? In one sense, obviously, we know the end. The I'm saying this for effect, okay? But we understand. 
It, life is vanity. Just seen on the surface of things. It's just true. It just is. And we, of all people, should know that better, actually, than unbelievers. We, as those who have been saved by grace from our sins and from the condemnation of hell, we see clearly, don't we? We see, man, this world is a sham. It's all an illusion. It's all, not an illusion, but it's all like, all the stuff that people live for and die for, it, it's just all, it's all fake. It's all worthless apart from Christ, apart from being in him and him being in us. It is hopeless, isn't it? He says, if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, we, we of all people are most to be pitied. And so it's true. Life apart from Christ is, is just pitiable. It's pathetic and it's sad. And everybody is going just a thousand miles an hour chasing after that thing which will fill their hearts. And it won't fill their hearts. They know it, but then they still, but they can't help going after it. Why? Because they don't have the right object of worship, which is Christ, will, who will fill their souls with joy and satisfaction and peace. So you're looking for it in all the wrong places, even when you know it's all the wrong places everywhere. There's no good place here. Jesus is the only rest stop. And believers, you and I, we know that. We know what that's like to chase after idols, even when we know that they're idols and they're meant to not to work out. We still know that, like career. How many of us have ever idolized career? Nobody, right? We have. How many of us have idolized health? Never, not in this season. How many of us have idolized appearance? How many of us have idolized intelligence? How many of us have idolized romance, friendship? On and on you can go. Even while we knew in those moments of sanity that the Spirit gives us, this is bad. This is wrong. This is bankrupt. It will not lead to anything but greater vanity and futility. We know that, okay? So, yeah, life is hard. Okay, let it be. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot where I was. Oh, external trials and hardships. Life is hard. So depression, by the way, in that case, again, it can be exacerbated by our moralism. If we are good, life will be better. In one sense, sure, life can be better. It's not promised to you. Let her be. Cultural factors. You ever thought about this? How you were raised, where you were raised, the kind of environment that your parents put you in, the kind of environments that your parents were, their parental techniques and strategies, the community you grew up in, the culture that you were born into, and the traditions that were passed down to you. you know, like every culture, every family has certain expectations and certain presumptions that you don't even think about, that you're just kind of born into, right? And uh, how that all shapes you could lead to things like depression. Teachers and friends and peers all around you, what to expect out of life. If I don't achieve a certain level of success, I'm a failure. Guess what? When you fail, you will become depressed. Right? So certain cultures strive for academic excellence, worldly status. What if you don't, that doesn't work out? Right? What if you don't get into that grad school? What if you don't become the doctor? What if you just are a whatever you want to call it? You're just this. Then your parents are sad, and then you're sad, and the whole nation mourns for you, okay? So cultural factors, everybody has different ones. I'm not talking about any cultural factor that I know of, though. No. Talking about my own. All right, so cultural factors, they are just, they get ingrained in you, and then things don't work out a certain way, and if you're born into that kind of a culture, you will be you'll be sad, okay? Letter C, but now this one is very controversial. Uh, I think we'll try to tackle this in the last class, but physiological factors. Now, I'm not speaking from medical expertise. This is all from reading and research, right? Physiological factors. So for example, we know this, certain illnesses, and certain medications, not antidepressants, we're talking about medications for other conditions you might have. Certain illnesses, certain conditions, and certain medications can aggravate feelings of depression, bring on feelings of depression. We know that, okay? But I would say, I think you would agree, that's an extenuating circumstance. Someone has that disease, they get treated for something, it's bringing on thoughts of depression, we can understand that. It's still a spiritual battle for that person, wouldn't we agree? They still have to deal with it rightly but we, i think there's an under, there's, there's like a i think there's a more natural or greater level of sympathy hey i get it man you have this liver condition or something it's causing a thyroid condition or this medication 
It's really strong. One of the side effects is this. Just like one of the side effects could be nausea. One of the side effects could be these kinds of thoughts. It, it's just powerful. It affects you. We get it. We understand it. It still doesn't exempt that person from dealing with their condition righteously, just like with any other condition, right? Just like if you were in any other pain physically, we would still want you to deal with it biblically. But here's where it gets tricky because it's not that kind of issue that's the problem. It's the issue of chemical imbalances in your brain and how the job of psychiatry has become almost exclusively neurochemistry. Neurochemistry and doing their best to give uh, like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is like self-talk, uh, to deal with it, with, along with, of course, with medication. With medication <laughs> being something um, that has more power often than, uh, than that kind of self-talk therapy. The problem with all of that, there's a lot, but we'll, we'll, I'm not gonna cover all of this right now, okay? Just, this is just for the sake of our, our, our lesson here. The problem with that, there is no airtight empirical proof that depression is caused by chemical imbalances <clears throat> somewhere inside of you in the brain, at the level of the synapses, which by the way, the blood can't even, you know, you can't even test by blood. It's only seen by symptoms, which then makes it interesting, right? Is it, the, is it, what's the, is it a cause or is it a correlation? Does that make sense? Like, did it cause it? Or because you're depressed for whatever reason, it causes certain symptoms to appear. Which, of course, is true for lots of things. For example, if you're super stressed, what does it cause on the outside or on the inside of your body? It causes lots of things, right? Like insomnia, for example. That's one thing. Uh, or high blood pressure. That would be another thing. Lots of other I mean, anxiety from stress. Very common. Depression from stress. Also very common, okay? So, of course, a depressed person who's truly depressed will have certain symptoms and show certain signs, even in like a, a, a brain scan, a CT scan, that are different from those who are not depressed. Of course. But the question is this, does that mean that a physiological neurochemical issue caused the depression? Did it cause it? Or is it the other way? That the depression brought about physiological changes that can be seen on a scan and of course then can be seen in the way that that person <coughs> lives that's the question okay and so guess what in the fine print antidepressant medications will say and, and and this is not just biblical counselors saying this these are psychiatrists secular psychiatrists say this they don't exactly know how and why certain medications work and some don't and how and why some work for some people and not for others there's an unknown there, a big unknown, a big mystery. And so that's where it gets interesting. So they don't exactly know how and why this is working or what it's actually doing or trying to do. We don't know why or how it works for some and not for others. And it raises a certain level of suspicion about those things, okay? We'll get into this more, but suffice it to say, that's, that's where we're at at this point, okay? Um, there's also genetic factors as well, genetic factors. Now, this also, we, we, this is not, we gotta be careful about this as well, but sometimes people see family history of certain things, family history of alcoholism, family history of depression, but uh, clusters of sin types in families. But here's the question, is that biological or is that due to nurture? Because you were raised by an alcoholic, right? <laughs> It's hard to distinguish between the two because, well, that person passed down their DNA to you, right? Mom and dad, they're both alcoholics. They did pass down their DNA to you. Now, whether or not there's something in the actual passing down, hard to say. The nurture certainly did have a, uh, have a part to play in. The question then would be like, why does it skip some generations and some family members are not as affected and why that brother, but not the sister, not that other brother, you know, and I don't know. But here's the thing, in terms of genetic factors, I don't know the answers. Nobody has final airtight answers to this, but we do know this, that the body is itself fallen. Yes, the body itself is predisposed to sins. 
some more than others. That's, a, that, that, that's that whole debate about looking for the gay gene, the homosexual gene, right? And they're like, well, even if they found something, guess what? They find something in all of us. We're all predisposed to some type of sinful behavior because of the sin nature in us. We're born dead in sin. So some people may seem to have a predisposition to melancholy and sadness and depression. But the fact is we all have fallen bodies cursed by sin. We're all groaning. I already mentioned Romans 8, right? But Romans 7, 23 to 24, Paul calls it, you know, this, the law of sin is in my members. And then he says, who will, you know, save me, rescue me from this body of death? It's a body of death that he's carrying around. He's a regenerate man. Uh, it's the outer man is decaying, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 4 talk about being, Paul says, we groan. We groan in the tent that we're living in right now, this mortal coil. But we groan because we're burdened in our bodies. We're burdened. It's this weight that we're carrying around because this body is not the way that it should be. That's why we're going to get a glorified body. On top of that, Psalm 51.5 says that we are all conceived in iniquity. Ephesians 2, dead in sin, right? Sin is inside of us. It's in the very fabric of who we are as human beings. It's in our DNA. And so we lose the body when we die. Our souls go to be with the Lord. But then one day what's going to happen? We're going to get new bodies, right? We're going to get brand new bodies with perfect DNA, perfect everything, and we'll be fine. But until that point, guess what? We still have this in us, don't we? We still have sin here. And so, of course, this, is, this should not be a stretch. Of course, we are all prone to certain sins more than others. And with different people, there's going to be different proneness. A lot of that could be, of course, because of the ways that we were brought up and the formative influences in, the, uh, in our lives, like people and the experiences that we've had. Of course. Could there be something biological? I don't know, but at least I know this. Sin is in, it's actually embedded in us. And so if you want to say that that's biological, sure, that's biological. That's why we get new bodies. But here's the thing. Predisposition does not equal predetermination. Once you say that this is why biblical counselors are hesitant, because once you say predisposed, it sounds like you're saying, oh, they can't help it, right? We want to be very careful about that. No. You can help it as a believer. An unbeliever, you are accountable regardless. Does that make sense? Being predisposed to depression. Let's say that's finally airtight proven truth. Okay, that's good. At least we know it. And we can help people then. But then that does not mean what? You're allowed to be just depressed and be sinfully depressed. You're allowed to. It's just okay to leave it unchecked. It's okay to wallow in it. And it's okay to just be resigned to it sort of passively, fatalistically. Well, it's in my genes. I can't do anything about it. By the way, we could say that for every sin then. Oh, by, oh, you know what? I'm predisposed to adultery, someone could say. I can't help it. God made me this way. You could find an, a, a, a loophole for anything at that point. So we need to be, so here's the thing. Even if it's proven to be somewhat biological, it still doesn't matter. A predisposition to anything doesn't mitigate or excuse my sinful emotions, my unbelief and doubt, and my sinful conduct flowing out of those sinful emotions and unbelief. Is that clear? Okay. So, of course, again, sort of the final nail on this, we are all predisposed to certain sins. We are, more than others. We're, just, we, we're predisposed to sin, period, but we're predisposed to certain sins more than others and different people, different sin types. Okay? So genetic factors, a little bit murky there, but biblically, yeah, there is a genetic factor. <laughs> My parents were sinners and their parents and their parents and on and on and on down to Adam and Eve, and that's been transferred all the way down. When Adam and Eve fell, it caused physiological changes, not just spiritual changes. That action, that spiritual action of sin from the heart out led to the downfall of man. It led to death, didn't it? Death being brought in. That's a physical thing. So there you go. Okay? So that actually shouldn't be that controversial. The only controversial thing is if you use like, oh, there's the gay gene. There's the alcoholic gene. There's the depression gene. And that equals I can get an ex a, 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 a get out of jail card because, hey, my body made me do it. I can't get out of it. Okay? Letter E, spiritual factors. There could be spiritual factors in depression. 
For example, probably the, the biggest one, or the most maybe obvious one, would be unrepentant sin. Sin that's unforsaken, held on to, you know it. We're not talking about sins of omission or ignorance that you're not aware of. But this is like David, when he held on to his sin and he didn't confess. Remember Psalm 32, what happened to his body? I mean, he was depressed for sure. You would be if all your life juices were sapped out of you. But that's what happened. There was, a, there was an internal and an external consequence to his holding on to his sin. Okay? But we, we want to be careful here not to jump to the conclusion automatically, oh, you're depressed? You must be sinning in some way, like Job's counselors or John 9 with the man born blind. How the Pharisees immediately jumped on that, right? We want to be careful about that. Remember, we stated that before. However, if, if I, if you are unwilling to let go of certain sins or a sin, of course that will lead to depression. I hope that goes without saying, but we need to say it. Because, <laughs> for example, not because, but for example, um, Ahab in 1 Kings 21.4. He wasn't getting what he wanted. What did he want? You remember that story? He wanted a vineyard of the man named Naboth. It's a fascinating little verse here. He wanted the vineyard. Naboth says, no, I can't give that to you. It's a family inheritance thing. You know better than that, king. Like each family gets their own plot of land. You can't just give that away. You can't sell it. And, and then Ahab, he's the king, not a very good king. He came into his house sullen and vexed. He was down and angry. Because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken of to him, for he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And look at this. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and ate no food. What does that sound like? It sounds like depression, doesn't it? He's throwing a little temper tantrum. It sounds like a baby, which is, I think, that's the point, right? He's the king of Israel, and he's acting like a, a little baby there, lying down on his face, like, I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to eat anything. Leave me alone. And that's why Jezebel comes in and goes, what's wrong with you? You're the king. You can do whatever you want. And, uh... You know, she didn't struggle with depression, apparently. Um, she struggled with murder, though. Um, so there you go, okay? So, of course, it's going to lead to depression because here's Naboth. I mean, not Naboth. Here's Ahab, and he's got this thing in his heart. I'm the king of Israel. I should get what I want. And that piece of real estate looks nice. I want it, okay? I want it. Naboth says, sorry, I can't give it to you, king. He's not even being mean about it. That's just, he can't. He shouldn't. Legally, theologically, he's not supposed to. And so what happened in what's going on in Ahab's heart is instead of God reigning supreme on the throne of his heart, who is? He is. His desires are. His desires have been elevated to idolatrous levels. He's worshiping a false god. It's like James 4, 1 to 3. You have these desires, then you don't get what you want. What happens? You get angry, you fight, you murder. It's exactly the trajectory of Ahab and Jezebel here with, Na Na uh, with Naboth because he ends up murdering him. So you don't get what you want. You want something, it's taken from you or it's thwarted. We talked about this many, many, many lessons ago, right? That's how sin works in our hearts. There's a lust, there's a desire in our heart, even for something benign. In this case, it's not. You don't get it and then out comes all of these symptoms, if you will, all of these things in his heart and then outside, life being sullen and vexed, not eating food, losing his appetite, not wanting to deal with anybody. And this is going on, of course, because underneath, when we're worshiping a false god, when we <clears throat> elevated a desire to idolatrous levels like this, we're out of tune with the one for whom our souls were made. We're not right with the Lord. We're not fellowshipping with him. We're not abiding in Christ. We're not enjoying him. We think having this will make me happier. Otherwise, why would he be sullen and vexed? Of course, he didn't get what he wanted, so he's unhappy. He's like, that was going to make me happy. And why did you take that away from me? And then he throws this temper tantrum. We're made to fellowship with God. We're made to fellowship with his son and the Holy Spirit. We're placed into fellowship with the triune God at the moment of salvation. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 tells us that. 1 John 1, 3, also. Okay. We're made to know him in that way, personally, experientially, deeply, in an ever-growing, real relationship. And if we're sinning, what happens? It's like... We're putting a block between him and us. It's like we're dislodging from that sweet spot of tasting and seeing his goodness. So, of course, what's going to go out immediately? Joy, peace, contentment. And we are going to grumble and complain, which is, an, a, uh, which is um, a symptom of depression, of course, right? And out goes all those things and uprises just 
melancholy, depression, sadness, whatever you want to call it. Out comes this, up comes this grief in our hearts. Okay? So unrepentant sin, which of course I think, you know, the answer to that is fairly obvious and easy to deal with in terms of repentance and forsaking that sin, confessing it before the Lord. Okay, so number two, though, uh, other spiritual factors. What about the devil? Satan. How do we know this? Well, we know this because in Ephesians 6, 11 to 12, Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And then he says this, for, why put on the full armor of God? Why, what is the schemes of the devil? And he goes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So our struggle in the faith is a spiritual one, and there are enemies arrayed against us, shooting flaming darts, uh, as Peter goes on to say, uh, no, as uh, Paul says uh, earlier in that same section, aimed at us, aimed at our faith, not to take away our faith because he can't, we can't lose our salvation, but Lloyd-Jones says this. He can make us feel as miserable as if we didn't have salvation. Okay, 1 Peter 5, 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. This is a call to everybody, every Christian. Your adversary, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. When you go into Revelation, this adversary, the devil, is said to be one who accuses us, slanders us day and night before God. He is not worthy of salvation. Look at him. Look at how he or she keeps sinning. They don't believe in your promises, God. You're going to save them? They're terrible. They're miserable. They're awful. Over and over, slandering and accusing us. That's what he does. He lies. And so both Peter and Paul and then uh, from John in Revelation, we get a picture of the devil and his cohort, his minions, doing this work. Not just in giving depression, but in every area. And how, how does this work? Well, again, he can't take away our salvation, but he can certainly do everything else possible under the sovereignty of God to make us feel miserable. Whether it's through bringing about trials, like a thorn in the flesh. Paul had that. Bet you that didn't feel good for him, right? Put, bringing up trials and tr uh, a trial like a situation or a trial in a person, making us miserable in every other way possible. By getting me to stay dejected over my own sins and failures and not focus on the blood of Christ, which cleanses my conscience and cleanses my soul, past, present, and future. Uh, you know, aggravating the disbelief in my heart and the, uh, and the promises of God that he is for me, that he's not against me. There's no condemnation that he's always going to be with me. He's never going to forsake me uh, to not see the hope that I have in Christ, but to have that be obscured by the struggles and the trials of this life or the loss of a loved one or the loss of something and making that more important and bigger than the living hope through the resurrection that I have in Jesus Christ to keep me withdrawing into the, the pit of my ever hungry ego. Just keep withdrawing into myself, thinking about myself, just listening to myself rather than looking out of myself and talking back truth to myself he'll get us to do that and then ultimately the, the spiritual factor number three god what i mean by this it's not that god is sinning by doing something or giving us something or giving us over to something or letting us be in something but ultimately as with anything god is sovereign over and in your depression he's sovereign over all of that Job 2.10 says this, Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Lamentations 3.37-38, Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass? Unless what? The Lord has commanded it. Okay, verse 38, Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill, which is the same word for adversity in Job 2.10, Is it not from Him that both good and bad, the good things of life, the blessings and the calamities and the disasters and the evil, doesn't it go forth without him being tainted by sin? It's under his sovereign orchestration. It's under his sovereignty. And that's a mystery, of course, but it's true. If you don't believe that God is sovereign over your depression, what happens? First thing that happens, you get more depressed. You do. If I don't believe that God is sovereign over this, I will get more depressed. I will lose peace and security. If God is not control, 
then what is in control, I will say? Who's in control? Me? I'm in control? My brain? My body? Let's say that. My brain is in control. I have no control over that. I can't fix it. None of these medications seem to really, really work and root out this, de this depression in me. I can't do anything about it. I'll, I'm trying to fix it. And if I can't fix it, then what? It's greater despair. And it leads to really, I mean, just more serious, more grave types of things. If God is not, or, or how about this? Like God, is God is not sovereign over this. But what, what about also like if God is not wise and loving in this, then where do I turn? All right. Also, God is not sovereign in this. God is not also not wise and loving in this. It's just sort of happening. And he is sort of there. I can't put two and two together. Then I'm going to look for answers anywhere and everywhere to get out of this. And I'm going to keep hitting a wall every time. Medication didn't work. This kind of therapy didn't work. You know, my service at church didn't work. Me doing things didn't work. Relationship didn't work. And, and you just get further and fur, further and further down into the abyss. If God is not sovereign, God is not wise, God is not loving, we are in a deeper hole than we can imagine. Okay? So those are some of the factors that those are, you know, the, the possible factors and causes of our, um, of our depression. Any questions before we move on to the last point here in battling it? Okay. There could be various factors in this, guys. Various factors. Um, none of them, of course, excuse or lessen the sinfulness of any of my sinful responses to those issues that attend my depression. And ultimately, if God is in control of my depression, this God, the God that is our Father, who loved me, who sent his son to die for my sins, if that's true, and it is, then there is a loving heart behind it, there is a wise purpose for it, and there's a genuine hope to overcome it, where I don't have to just swallow in it and sink down further and further and further. There is. I have to believe that, and I do believe that, okay? In light, especially, particularly in light of the cross, and how he dealt with my biggest problem of all, which is my sin against him, all right? Number three then, and with that, battling depression, the big picture. So we're going to talk about this in three steps here, which are not, which are steps, but it all happens sort of really fast simultaneously. Your mind, your heart, and your will. Uh, put it another way, like your thoughts, your affections, and your drive to do something or not do something. Okay? The big picture here. Letter A. In terms of the mind. Okay. It's like you read something, it's entering through your brain, right? You're reading it, well, it's entering through your eyes. And then here, you're processing it in, in your brain, in your mind. Now, here's the error with dealing with depression. The error is to bypass your thoughts, your mind, and go straight for your feelings. Because you're feeling bad, right? Or to go straight for your will, because often when you're depressed, you don't want to do lots of things, do you? Right? Remember the last time you felt truly depressed? You didn't want to get out of bed. You didn't want to do anything. Okay? And you became disheveled and unkempt, and you're just like sort of there but not there floating through life. Okay. So... You want to get, you want to, you, you're like, I feel terrible. I just feel blah. I want to like get some motive and drive in me. To bypass the mind and go straight for either one is a, is a, is a really um, a bad error here. The temptation, of course, is the feelings are so powerful and so painful that I have to have relief. That's what we're thinking. I want to feel better and I'll do whatever it takes. At a certain point, you'll say, I'll do whatever it takes to feel better if it's not going away. The problem there, and this is a little side note, the problem there is like feeling better is not the end all be all. Feeling better is not. Paul understood that if you know 2 Corinthians, right? He had the thorn of the flesh, he prayed three times. It's amazing that he says only three times. I'm like, 33 times or 130, like all the time? He said three times. You gotta believe it, right? He said three times and God says, you will still have pain. It will still hurt you. Maybe it was physical. Maybe not. We don't know. It could be either 